Hello and welcome to this talk on sustainable anaesthesia for veterinary clinics and this is a joint initiative between investors in the environment and Linnaeus Sustainability in order to try and give some tools to general practitioners, both vets and vet nurses, in how to make your anaesthesia more sustainable. What we're going to cover today is a little bit about understanding the environmental impacts of veterinary anaesthesia. And as a specialist veterinary anaesthetist who still practices in the clinic, as well as the environmental sustainability lead for Linnaeus, I know how hard it is to translate what you're gonna to learn today into the clinic. So we're gonna be talking also about some practical steps to reduce the climate impacts of your anaesthesia practice. I do need to add a disclaimer, and that is that any alterations that you make to your anaesthetic protocols, uh, including the drugs, are really the responsibility of the veterinary surgeon uh, working within their competency. And the guidance that we're going to be talking about today don't replace that individual veterinary surgeon's responsibility for that clinical decision making. So please do contact a specialist anaesthetist individually if you're unsure about changing your anaesthetic protocols or indeed anything that we mention in the talk here today. Now, a little housekeeping job for you, if you don't mind. Um, get hold of a pen and paper and a calculator. And if you can download the Anaesthetic Impact Calculator app, and that's a free app available, um, that will help us later on when we come to calculating some of the impacts so that you can understand how we can play with um, our machines and our vaporizers and our fresh gas flows in order to reduce the impacts of anaesthesia. And there's a QR code there for you to access it as well. There's a lot of talk about carbon. And it isn't just about carbon when we're talking about environmental impacts, but carbon accounting is more easily achieved than some of the other key environmental impacts. And as long as we bear those other impacts in mind, when we address our carbon impacts, we often also address other impacts. And I hope I'll explain why as we go through. So the three areas I, I think about are global heating, and that's in terms of causing the climate crisis biodiversity loss and resource scarcity. And I've given some examples here of how our general veterinary clinic can impact on those three key areas. And then obviously you can start to understand how an aesthetic practice might um, impact on those areas. The planetary boundaries model uh, on the picture on the right hand side gives us safe zones for humanity to operate safely within. And these are nine key geophysical processes that happen within Earth's ecosystems that define this safe space for, for humanity. And you can see that we've exceeded that green safe operating space within six of the key uh, planetary boundaries um, areas. And those are for biosphere integrity or biodiversity, climate change, novel entities, which is for microplastics and chemicals, uh, biogeochemical flows for nitrogen and phosphate cycles, and also how we're using our land systems. Whilst all of these ecosystems are interlinked, um, we know that climate change and biodiversity are really the linchpins for influencing the other boundaries. If you start to understand healthcare impacts and start to read the literature, you'll, you'll start to understand this difference between what we directly control and what we influence. And in the carbon accounting world, that's split into three scopes, scope one, two and three. And scope one is really what you're directly controlling. Um, so it would be things like your travel, your energy use, um, the uh, anaesthetic gases that you're using. And those are emissions that are directly coming from the site operations. They might also be called operational. Scope two is electricity, and that is um, an indirect scope because the electricity is generated elsewhere and the emissions are generated elsewhere, but you are using the electricity on site. So scope one and two are classically your operating emissions. Scope three would be things that you're indirectly responsible for. So that's your procurement um, and your pharmaceutical use. The next obvious question to ask is which of these scopes matters the most? Is it the things under our direct control is or is it the things under our indirect control? And you can see here from the NHS England's carbon footprint that actually the scope three footprint, which is in the procurement, in the supply chain, in the resources which we, we buy in, uh, there's a far greater part of our carbon footprint. Uh, but there still are those things which are uh, within our direct control, and that would be represented in the green area here for the scope one um, and electricity scope two. Now, some of these impacts you'll notice are healthcare specific impacts, things like the anaesthetic gases, and some are not healthcare specific. So if we look at the UK's uh, carbon footprint, we start to see that in terms of the UK sectors, the transport and the energy supply sector are two huge um, impacts of area. Um, and in terms of our anaesthetic practice, we can imagine that it, these two areas are going to also form a large part of our carbon footprint. 
So we need to start looking at some of these non-healthcare specific impacts. And with regard to anaesthesia, obviously you are, uh, your staff are providing anaesthesia and you need to think about how they're getting into the clinic. Um, we've also got the transport of the pets into the clinic um, and even transport of, um, of goods and services to the clinic as well. In terms of energy, you can start to think about, well, how can we reduce our energy use? And one very successful campaign we've had across Linnaeus is to use the pause to turn off stickers as a behavioural nudge um, to encourage people to turn off high consumption things like um, anaesthetic gas scavenging systems or lights or computers or air conditioning. So those two areas I just mentioned now because they are an important part of the anaesthetic practice carbon footprint, although they're not healthcare specific. I just wanted to touch on what's in scope three for anaesthesia. So in terms of the high um, impact areas for uh, our supply chain within the um, anaesthesia surface, there are two key areas, I think, and that is within consumables um, and equipment. So what we're what we're buying in, but also the pharmaceuticals. Um, and one area I wanted to highlight was oral versus injectables. So we know um, from some medical data that uh, a one gram intravenous dose of paracetamol produces 10 times more carbon emissions than the same oral dose. And obviously you also have the energy for delivery and plastics in the um, delivery system if you're giving an intravenous uh, dose. Um, we also know that the carbon footprint of anaesthetic drugs can vary widely, depending mainly on how many steps there are in the manufacturing process. So propofol, for instance, is around about 20 kilograms of CO2 emissions per kilogram of active drug, compared with dexmedetomidine being around 3000 kilograms of CO2 per active um, kilogram of drug. In terms of finding environmentally positive veterinary systems, we can also recognise that pet ownership has a positive impact on improving human health and therefore reducing carbon emissions elsewhere in the owner's um, life cycle. And for dog owners, there's a 24% reduction in all cause risk of death. Although obviously to protect animal welfare and acknowledge that not all humans enjoy the company of animals, um, it's not going to be an appropriate um, step for everybody to take. So I think there will be a need to move towards preventative care focusing in sustainable health care. So we move away from this high resource consumption, high emission area, such as an operating theatre, and towards the idea of well-being and green prescriptions. In terms of consumables, I wanted to touch on reuse versus single use. And again, there's a lot of anaesthetic equipment which is becoming available, which is reusable. And, and um, there is still, I think, a plastic addiction um, within the healthcare sector. And the conflict really is in infection control um, versus sustainability. And we do need more data on this um, in this area. But the fallback has often been of dispose of it if in doubt. Uh, and medical groups often encourage the use of single use equipment to prevent infection spread. But, but that may not all be, always be necessary, nor may it be based on, on data in, in every situation. So in terms of the cons, it's just to be aware that if you do get an infection, that obviously carries quite a large carbon cost. So we do need to maintain infection control as an important quality process. Um, and if you're reusing fabrics, actually, um, the risk of infection may depend on the age or the permeability of that fabric. So you need to make sure you're using appropriate reusables um, and for appropriate cases. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that many devices uh, are labelled as single use so that if you reuse them and the device fails uh, or you get an infection as a result of uh, poor sterilisation in reuse, that liability rests with the person that's reused it and not with the manufacturer. And so that's something we need to work with the manufacturers for. But obviously the pros, if you're reusing equipment pretty much um, across every uh, life cycle impact that you can think of from carbon to resource use to water use um, to uh, aquatoxicity, you're going to get less of a footprint on reusable equipment and textiles than on um, single use devices. And if you are using single use de uh, devices, there's less resiliency against disruptions in your supply chain, and which we certainly saw during COVID. I think the last point I would say is that often when you're using plastic or you're using um, plastic gloves to protect a surface or to protect your, your body, there's a false sense of security and it actually reduces the, the hand hygiene and potentially even increases infection risk due to dermatitis um, for wearing gloves. So it's worth bearing in mind using your plastics appropriately uh, when they're really needed and not using them when they're not needed. I just threw this slide in here to suggest that there are some things that you can start reusing straight away. Um, there was a study uh, that suggested that the carbon emissions from a laparoscopic hysterectomy can be reduced by 80% um, and 50% of those savings come from minimising and reusing surgical equipment. So the idea of reuse rather than trying to look at better ways of end disposal is probably more um, better impact, higher impact.
What about scope one? So really honing in now, what's in your direct control for anaesthesia? Um, the first thing I wanted to highlight was there was a consensus statement from the medical anaesthetist that was published in the journal Anaesthesia very recently, um, which just highlighted that we are not tr um, trying to change patient safety. If anything, we want to improve patient safety through um, sustainable anaesthetic practices. Um, but it is an onus and a responsibility on us to find these more sustainable systems for providing anaesthesia. So really starting at the start, uh, the most important thing to realise is that the volatile anaesthetic gases are greenhouse gases. And I'll give you some data to kind of support that now. So if you were to take a bottle of isofluorine, I don't recommend that you do this, and you were to smash it on the ground and let all of the vapour release into the air, you would get a similar um, greenhouse gas impact as if you drove from John O'Groats to Plymouth in an average UK car. And all modern inhalational anaesthetics uh, act as greenhouse gases. Now for NHS England, the anaesthetic gases contribute about 2% of the full value uh, carbon footprint, so including all of the scopes. And that's a similar proportion to the full value chain footprint that we're finding within Linnaeus as a whole, um, bearing in mind that we predominantly have small animal practices. Uh, for the operational carbon footprint, the anaesthetic gases may be a far higher proportion. So what's in our direct control? And that's typically around about 30% of your carbon footprint um, in, in many of our clinics. So if you think about the other aspects like um, travel and energy that we know are very important, that we have sustainable solutions for, um, and, and we can start to put those into place, you can see that suddenly the anaesthetic gases will become more significant um, as we decarbonise elsewhere in our clinics. Now you might say, well, 2% is not a large percent. So although they present a very, um, a relatively low contribution to the, the global carbon emissions, we need to control these drugs because they're disproportionately affected with greenhouse gases. And the reason is they absorb radiation from the sun in this window where there isn't a natural um, absorption of heat. So it's basically like an atmospheric cooling window. And because it plugs that cooling window, it's disproportionately effective as a greenhouse gas. And there was one study that suggested that the anaesthetic agents are responsible for 10 to 15 percent of all uh, human um, sourced radiative forcing of the climate since the industrial era. So it is something which is going to become um, more important as uh, decarbonisation happens elsewhere. Now, I just wanted to give you a sense for an individual procedure. So this is for a modelling for a TPLO um, procedure. And we um, want to thank Dr. Tom Pierce for um, giving us his modelling calculator for this. And we're assuming that we're delivering um, oxygen at two litres a minute uh, and isofluorine at 2%. And we've got a three hour procedure. And we've also accounted for the um, commuting of a surgeon and of a nurse um, to that, to that theatre for the day and some dis waste disposal of the plastics and, um, and the other waste materials. So we try to account for um, the impacts that you're going to find that are going to be major impacts. And you can see that the anaesthetic gases are going to be a large proportion, around about three quarters of that carbon footprint. And the whole procedure is around about 150 miles in, and again, a medium average UK car. So that's just to give you a sort of sense of, of how this anaesthetic footprint sits within the picture of um, your other choices. So what options have we got for anaesthesia? And these, again, I'm just really honing down on those options which are available um, and practical for us uh, as clinicians um, in our day-to-day -day practice. So the options as I see them um, are to eliminate nitrous oxide, to move towards lower flow anaesthesia, and I'm going to go through all these options separately, to switch to lower carbon choices, and in the future, um, it's likely to be possible to recapture volatile agents. So let's go through those options. So you can eliminate nitrous oxide. Now, if you are using nitrous oxide in your clinic, many clinics will find that that will account for um, up to 30, 40% of your total clinic operational emissions. It's such a potent greenhouse gas, and it's also an ozone depleting agent. Um, and because of the other health and safety implications and the fact that it's not actually that um, potent as an anaesthetic agent, uh, we decided across Linnaeus to remove it entirely um, from our practices. And so we um, ran our No Need for Nitrous campaign. We linked our specialist anaesthetists with our primary care teams and we took it out across the group in a phased um, uh, supported way. And that took for us across the whole group, even though out of about 200 clinics, only about 20 clinics had nitrous canisters, it took 2% of our operational footprint out, um, which is around about 129 tonnes of CO2 in, in one year. 
So taking nitrous oxide out is, I think, a very important first step because it's likely to be the very uh, high impact. And that's certainly what the NHS is focusing on, is, is taking nitrous out where, where they can and reducing it in, in situations like labour wards. Now, for lower flow anaesthesia, the trick to understanding this is if you can reduce your fresh gas flow by any amount, you will use proportionately less anaesthetic because the fresh gas flow um, of oxygen or medical air that's carried past the vaporizer will pick up a directly proportionate amount of your anaesthetic agent. And the vast majority, if you're using um, active scavenging or um, passive scavenging where you emit to the atmosphere um, systems, uh, the vast majority of that anaesthetic will not be metabolized by the patient. It will be released directly into the atmosphere. So however you can reduce um, your fresh gas flow or indeed your percentage of your of your vaporizer setting, you will also proportionately use less use and release less anaesthetic agent. Now, we run our We Go for Low Flow campaign. We started this in 2021 um, and we supported it with um, delivery of capnographs. And we'll talk about how important they are as well. Um, and we're starting to see our um, actual purchasing of anaesthetic gases come down now, despite business growth. Uh, we've made all these resources available on um, our Linnaeus website, so please feel free to access and download them. Um, the poster here uh, gives you the headline and there is an infographic behind that to give you the detail. Um, and again, we're going to go through some of the detail now. Um, but there are basically four steps in how you can approach um, uh, using low flow. What I wanted to highlight in this step is really the obvious things. Um, if you can be efficient in the way that you plan your anaesthetics, in the way that you um, carry out them. If you make sure you're leak testing your machines regularly um, to make sure that you haven't got leaks in your anaesthetic machine or breathing systems, um, and uh, you can consider sedation and max bearing drugs where possible, you will reduce your flows. Um, and that's independent of the other techniques I'm gonna teach you. Just to highlight here what the difference, um, or what I mean when I say lower flow versus low flow anaesthesia. So low flow is a technical term um, defined using low fresh gas flows, as you might imagine, and they're usually 0.5 to 1 litre per minute. And then there are other terms which define using less than 0.5 uh, litres per minute. Now, we don't advocate that on the whole because in general, it, needs, it means that you need precision vaporizers, you need precision retometers. Um, you can get some risk of, of hypoxic gas delivery and also accidental awareness. And so this is where people can get caught out by the anaesthetic depths being less than um, they realised and the animal actually waking up during the procedure. So in general, we're advocating going down to one litre per minute with the understanding that your equipment is, is capable of, of delivering um, safely at that level. Uh, lower flow anaesthesia, um, your two options really for doing that are either to use non-rebreathing systems um, which have no soda lime or rebreathing systems which contain soda lime. There's more detail about the low, low flow versus low flow in the paper which I've given there, and that's a free access paper um, on the veterinary anaesthesia and analgesia website. Now, how important is this? Uh, I think it's really useful to understand what you can do in your personal life and what you can do in your professional life and what you can do by influencing um, in, in the people that you come into contact with. So this is really just to highlight um, what kind of carbon saving you can get with the kind of personal choices which are often advocated. So you will see that we need to head towards about two and a half tonnes per person um, by 2030. Uh, and in 2018, the average UK carbon footprint was about seven. So it's just to give you a sense of scale of, of the kind of changes that you can make. So if you're recycling um, um, everything that you can in your domestic life, uh, then you can save about 2.2 tonnes of carbon emissions per year. If you eat a plant based diet, about 0.8 you don't fly transatlantic uh, on a return trip, uh, 1.6. And if you don't drive a car, about 2.4. And if you can manage a fresh gas flow uh, reduction of 25% using isofluorine, you can save about 3.5 tonnes of CO2 emissions per year. So you can see that actually the biggest impact that you can have personally is to take these principles into your workspace. Now, you might say, well, OK, you've just asked some modelling there, um, is that actually realistic? Is that actually possible? Um, are we actually going to achieve that? So I just wanted to give you some examples, um, both from theory and from um, our uh, experiences within Linnaeus. So there was a lovely paper by um, Matt McMillan in 2021, and he, he made a hypothetical in intervention based on clinical cases in, in the clinic that he was working in. So he, he looked at a load of anaesthetic records and he said, I'm going to assume now that I've got all of the, the, these um, cases and that instead of getting what they did get, we could have 
put everything under uh, five kilos on a Mapleton A system and everything over five kilos on a circle system. And we could have set the flows at um, safe minimum flows of a litre per minute. And he projected that you could get about 63% uh, reduction in carbon emissions by that simple um, behavioural change. Our experiences at two of our referral centres were that in practice, when we put low flow training in, uh, we got between 20 and 50% reductions. And since Linnaeus has been running its We Go For Low Flow campaign, and we delivered capnographs to every site um, in order to achieve that, uh, we've seen a 5% reduction in anaesthetic gas purchasing in 2022 so far, um, and we're aiming to increase that with time. So how do we do this? How do we actually reduce our flows? And I said before, we're looking at using either non-rebreathing systems, um, and if you're familiar with them, which I'm sure you are, uh, you'll know that those are for patients uh, under about five to 10 kilos. If you're not sure, check the manufacturer's guidelines for your systems. And um, those will be primarily either TPS variants or mini lax. Or if you've got a patient over five to 10 kilos, you're gonna be using a rebreathing system which contains sodalime. So anything with sodalime is a rebreathing system. And the main type we use is a circle system. Now, my only caveat here is for safety, if you're using um, uh, non-rebreathing systems, look for those that have one of these APL valves, which is not fixed. So it's an adjustable pressure limiting valve, which has a pressure relief limit. So you can't overpressurize your patient. So those APL valves don't lock shut and you can't um, overinflate the lungs with them. So that's um, just something to look for. In this example, the, the APL valve with safety release is um, blue. So we're going to start with non-rebreathing systems. So these are only appropriate for use in smaller patients. Um, so we've said under five to 10 kilos, uh, many of them will, will be quite comfortable um, up to 10 kilos, but generally we're going to be trying to put larger patients onto the circle breathing system. Um, now, the non-rebreathing systems which can automatically use lower flows include the Lack and Mini Lack and Humphrey, and that's compared with the T-piece. So the T-piece variants use um, sometimes up to double uh, or even triple the flows of a lack and a Humphrey AD in A mode. Um, bearing in mind that those calculations that are there are based on an average and they're not based on your individual animal. So if you want to use any of these systems, be it a T piece uh, or a lack or a Humphrey and use it um, providing the minimum flow for that individual patient, that's where you need a capnograph. So if you have a capnograph, what you can do is almost jettison those um, calculations and just use your capnograph to guide your fresh gas flow. So what you're going to do is titrate your fresh gas flow down using the capnograph to find the lowest fresh gas flow, which just prevents rebreathing. Um, and just to highlight again, this only works with normal breathing systems. This is not applicable for circle breathing systems. Now, there's just a little quiz here. So just in your head, can you link the capnogram to the problem? So we've got three capnograms there and three possible answers um, for what um, those capnograms show. And I'll just give you a couple of minutes to have a look at those because it's really important here if we're going to be identifying rebreathing to know what rebreathing looks like. Um, so one of those is rebreathing. Um, the two others are rhythms that you need to respond to urgently. They're emergency um, capnograms. So it's really worth knowing those as well, which is why I put those three in. So if you hadn't guessed it already, um, capnograph one is C, it's a bronchospasm. Um, Capnogram two is your rebreathing of CO2. So you're seeing that during the inspiratory phase, instead of coming down to baseline, the, uh, the line is sitting just above baseline. And capnogram three, therefore, is your cardiac arrest, and that's with a ventilated patient. So you're seeing a stepwise reduction with every breath. Good, good. So I want to show you a video now, and this is one of a series of three videos that we recorded um, to help uh, train people to, um, to support lower flow anaesthesia, actually from, from the start of the COVID epidemic. So this one is about using your capnogram to guide your fresh gas flow when you're using a non rebreathing system. I'm Ellie West. I'm one of the veterinary anaesthetists here at Davies Veterinary Specialists, and this is a short video to teach you how to use your capnograph to reduce your fresh gas flow when you're using a non-rebreathing system. The fresh gas flow calculations for non-rebreathing systems are given here for a Mapleson A and D system, and they're around 200 to 500 mils per kilo per minute. These values are based on a circuit factor, which varies between the systems, multiplied by an average value for minute ventilation. Remember, there is a different calculation for rebreathing systems or systems that contain soda lime.
We need to remember that there are three phases to the respiratory cycle. We breathe in, we breathe out, and then we take a pause. And that pause is really important to allow the fresh gas flow to flush any exhaled CO2 out of the system. So we breathe in a little bit from the inspiratory limb, but actually mostly from the expiratory limb and the reservoir bag. We breathe out into the expiratory limb and we breathe out a chunk of CO2 laden gas. And then we take a pause and it's during that pause that the fresh gas flow will flush that CO2 laden gas away out up the expiratory limb, ready for the next breath to take in clean, fresh gas with no CO2 in. That means that when we look at a normal capnogram, we'll see an end tidal CO2 of around 35 to 45 millimetres of mercury in a dog, and it's a little less than a cat, and a fraction of inspired CO2 of zero. So during exhalation, the CO2 rises, and during inhalation, it falls to zero or to the baseline. If the flushing by the fresh gas flow during the expiratory pause becomes inadequate, either because the respiratory rate increases or the fresh gas flow decreases, we're going to start to see rebreathing of CO2. If left, or if the rebreathing is large, this will cause the end tidal CO2 to increase, which can be dangerous for your patient. It's possible to decrease the inspired CO2 to zero by increasing the fresh gas flow on a non-rebreathing system. You can see that calculations for average minute volume are never perfect for each individual patient. But by using the capnograph, you can titrate the fresh gas flow to exactly what your patient needs. I'm going to ask our nurse to slowly turn down the fresh gas flow on this dog attached to a T-piece breathing system until she starts to see rebreathing occur. She can then nudge the fresh gas flow up until she no longer sees rebreathing. You'll see within a few breaths that rebreathing of CO2 is eliminated by reducing the fresh gas flow to exactly what your patient needs. The flow that you need may change during anaesthesia if the respiratory rate changes. Doing this, you can reduce your use of volatile anaesthetic agents by 20 to 50%, which reduces the greenhouse gas emissions that these gases cause. Bear in mind to use nitrous oxide with care with these systems. We do recommend that you don't use nitrous oxide because it is such a potent greenhouse gas. Next, we're moving into talking about circle breathing systems. And you'll notice that one of the three videos we, um, we recorded are, is a short introduction to circles as well. And there's also a lot more detail on circle breathing systems in the Linnaeus resources um, in the infographic and also a, a top line guide in the poster. So we're talking about systems that contain sodalime or CO2 absorbent. And we're talking about reducing your fresh gas flow to a safe minimum. We're not talking about taking it down to the absolute um, lowest possible uh, fresh gas flow. So we're looking at making it safe for your equipment, for your patient and your circumstances. So I'm assuming that you're comfortable using a circle breathing system um, and that you've got a system that can uh, work down to about a five to 10 kilo weight of the patient, that you must have spare an intravenous anaesthetic and an IV catheter so that if you have accidental awareness, you have a quick response system, that your machines and vaporizers are capable of delivering one litre per minute of fresh gas flow. Um, and if you have fraction of inspired O2 and end tidal agent monitoring, particularly if you're trying to use lower flows than one litre per minute, um, that's really recommended. But like I say, that's why we're suggesting that you start trying to get down to one litre per minute and no less um, with the majority of the systems that are available in the UK. And if you have any questions about any of that, then please um, do get in touch. So the pros of using circle breathing systems is that you're going to save money, you're going to re reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, you're going to conserve temperature and humidity within the system, which is important for patient safety. Um, but as we discussed before, there is a risk of dilution of the anaesthetic agent, particularly when you bring your flows down um, too soon after the start of the anaesthetic. So you need a higher fresh gas flow to start with. Um, there is a slower onset offset time. So the patient may uh, have accidental awareness or can't get settled into anaesthesia if you try and come down to the uh, minimum flows before uh, too soon. Um, so you need a higher fresh gas flow when you're changing the depth of anaesthesia, be that at the start, at the end or in the middle of the procedure. Um, and in theory, you can deliver hypoxic mixes um, if you're using low flows for prolonged periods or if you're using nitrous oxide. So again, that's why we're stopping at one litre per minute. 
Now, this is where I want you to um, get your pen and paper and get your anaesthetic impact calculator. And so if you've got the app open, um, you'll have two choices, uh, ET um, CO2 control um, vaporizer, sorry, ET control vaporizer or tech plenum. And I want you to go to tech plenum and that's the type of vaporizers that we typically use in veterinary anaesthesia. And I want you to just note down what your usual fresh gas flow would be um, for four periods. So four 15 minute periods during an hour anaesthetic. And let's suggest that we've got a 20 kilo dog. Um, so we're using whatever you would normally use for a 20 kilo dog. Um, we've got a pre-medication that's typically ACP or maybe metatomidine with an opioid. We're doing a dental and we've put some local nerve blocks in. Um, and we're using a, a circle, but you, you could also model it on, on a non rebreather Just choose whichever fresh gas flow you would typically use. And we're using isofluorine. So if you just jot down for four periods what um, you're going to use. Now, if you adjust in the anaesthetic impact calculator, the fresh gas flow and the vaporizer dial, you'll be able to model these three, four scenarios or indeed model any other scenario that you're interested in. So what I wanted to highlight is if you had scenario one, so what I would suggest scenario one is that you have the whole hour at three litres a minute of oxygen and you have it at 2% of ISO. And if you model that, then you'll see that the total anaesthetic carbon footprint that you're going to get from the isofluorine is 14.2 kilograms of CO2 emissions. Now, if you model, instead of using three litres a minute of oxygen, you're going to model this time, you're going to use half and half of oxygen nitrous. You're going to see that we're going to get an enormously higher footprint from the nitrous oxide. And so that's one of the prime reasons that we're, we're discouraging use of, of nitrous oxide on the whole. Now, scenario three is what I'm talking about with going to low fl lower flow, which is saying that we start off with a higher fresh gas flow of oxygen. It doesn't actually need to be 15 minutes. Usually five to 10 minutes is enough. But until your patient is settled under anaesthesia and has had time to denitrogenate. Um, and then we come down to one litre per minute for the rest of the anaesthetic, assuming that it's a stable anaesthetic. You'll see that we can half the carbon emissions from that procedure by reducing um, the fresh gas flow to one litre per minute. We haven't changed the vaporizer setting at all. Now, the fourth scenario is a little bit different. I've done something a little bit tricky here. So what I've done is I've said we've got 10 minutes at the start, um, as per usual, with our three litres a minute. Um, and then we've actually reduced the fresh gas flow, but we've increased the ISO a little bit. So we've given basically the patient a little bit longer with a concentration gradient coming, in, coming into, the, um, into the lungs and into the bloodstream. So that if your patient is not quite settled yet, but you want to start to bring your fresh gas flows down, um, then you can think about just upping your isofluorine in the knowledge that in a circle breathing system, what you deliver, what the fresh, um, uh, so the fraction of inspired isofluorine is uh, at the vaporizer will not be the same that the patient breathes in. And that's a bit of a, a complicated one to understand. And the reason for it is, is what the patient breathes in through the circle is a mix of what you've delivered at the vaporizer and what the patient has breathed out in the previous breath. And at the start of anaesthesia, the patient has still got quite a low concentration of isofluorine in their body. So that's going to dilute the isofluorine that's, um, that's available um, for the patient to breathe in. So that's why for just, just a short period, you can just up your vaporizer a little bit and just keep that concentration gradient so the patient settles under anaesthesia. And obviously all of this has to be judged clinically based on the depth of anaesthesia. There's no other way to do it than looking, observing, getting your hands on your patient. And then I've modelled at the end there, we've got our patient settled and we've actually managed to reduce our isofluorine to one and a half percent there. And you can see we can get a further saving in our carbon footprint by doing that. Now, we talked earlier on about another option, which is not talking about reducing the fresh gas flow, but actually saying, what about using lower carbon impact anaesthetics? And we've already said nitrous is a particularly bad uh, anaesthetic agent to be using, as is desfluorine. Isofluorine is, um, is better than nitrous or desfluorine, but actually sevofluorine has uh, an even lower carbon impact than isofluorine. And despite it, its lower potency, so you need more of sevofluorine because its MAC is higher, so it's, it's a less potent drug, um, it actually has a lower carbon impact. It's a less of a greenhouse gas than isofluorine. So overall, sevofluorine is about 50% less carbon intensive when you use it clinically. So you can save 50% of your carbon emissions. Now, the, my caution with sevofluorine is um, it is a different anaesthetic agent, so you do have to get a different vaporizer for it and it handles slightly different clinically. Um, but that the UK label warnings say that long duration, low flow sevofluorine anaesthesia should be avoided. 
and that's based to a, a, a theoretical concern about nephrotoxic compound A production in the presence of SIVO plus sodaline. So whilst this is likely to be a theoretical concern and there are no reports of harm in clinical veterinary anaesthesia and there's even debate in, as to the medical significance, um, there's not a published consensus in um, veterinary medicine and veterinary anaesthesia for using sevoflurane for prolonged low flow anaesthesia in animals. And the recommendations that the US data sheets make for people are that you shouldn't expose um, uh, patients to more than two MAC hours. Um, so you're talking about um, keeping a patient at MAC, 2.3% of SIVO, for no more than two hours, or double MAC for no more than one hour. And that they don't recommend going down to fresh gas flows less than one litre per minute. So I think that there's the jury's still out on that as to what the consensus will be across the UK in the long run. But, um, but it's an important thing to highlight if you're um, thinking about using sevoflurane for long, long procedures at lower flows. But perhaps logistically, the bigger issue at the minute is it's far more expensive in the veterinary market at the moment. Um, although in the future, I would hope that that price will come down. So just to model that again, um, and I've used um, the same uh, modelling for scenario one. And uh, again, just to highlight that these Fresh gas flows and percentages may not be appropriate for every case, but I'm just picking a typical um, case here. Uh, that if you use uh, ISO or SIVO at three litres per minute at clinical doses, then you're going to be looking at halving your um, carbon impact by using sevoflurane, and you can see that in both um, both of the models. So the obvious next question is, what about reducing the vaporizer percentage? So we talked about the fresh gas flow, but what about the vaporizer? And there are um, a number of ways that you can do that. And there's lots of resources around uh, TIVA, PIVA, regional blocks, um, systemic analgesia or sedatives in order to smooth your anaesthetic out so that you're not having to have those increases in fresh gas flow during your anaesthetic. Um, and so I refer you really to the BSAVA manuals and, and other training courses for for those techniques but again it may well be worth investigating those if you think that you can tweak your your regimens but TIVA I just want to touch on because there were um, data that came out uh, in, in um, 2012 about the carbon impacts of various anaesthetic choices and you can see from this gra gra graph where um, they've compared desflurane, isoflurane, sevoflurane and propofol and the red is uh, nitrous so they've used um, protocols where nitrous has been involved that it's very clear uh, that using nitrous, using desflurane, um, and in this model, sevoflurane would have been um, half this impact uh, shown in the graph, except for they used it at two litres per minute because of the compound A risk. Um, so you would see that, that actually propofol on this, it is actually on the graph, it's just really, really teeny. And they modelled that propofol anaesthesia produces four orders of magnitude less carbon emissions than um, the high, heaviest impact volatile procedure. So that makes you immediately think, well, crikey, TIVA is the way to go if you're just looking at the carbon emissions. But then very recently, another paper has come out um, and this is a, a little, little less easy to understand. But basically, the upshot is that the SIVO UKB option is very similar to the propofol option in terms of carbon emission. And the way this was modelled was that they were using sevoflurane anaesthesia. They were using a fresh gas flow at 0.5 litres per minute. They weren't using nitrous oxide. Um, they were using low carbon manufacturing techniques, um, but they were also recapturing the sevoflurane. So it's, um, it's suggested that we can actually capture in a charcoal like cylinder uh, about 70% of the anaesthetic that's exhaled by a patient, distill that, put it back in a bottle, sterilise it and send it back out for reuse. And, and that recapture technology is one way that volatiles could become very similar in carbon impact to uh, propofol anaesthesia. So I think in the future that might be available. It's not commercially available yet, um, but they are starting to recapture sevoflurane for this purpose in medical trusts in the UK. But we're talking about carbon there. And as we started saying at the beginning, carbon is not the only thing. Um, and the things that we don't know and the things that maybe we need to be a bit cautious about with TIVA, um, I want to just mention on this slide. So, we know that propofol and alfaxlone carry UK licenses for maintaining anaesthesia in dogs and cats, but the dose and duration at the moment are limited depending on the manufacturer and product. Um, so we don't uh, exactly have a comparable uh, TIVA protocol that will provide the longevity of anaesthesia um, in a licensed way that, that we have for volatiles at the moment. So 
The other issue that we have is that Tiva is a very different feel of anaesthetic and you do need um, precision equipment that isn't uh, available on the um, veterinary market at the moment. So I'm talking about target controlled infusion pumps for propofol Tiva. Um, you need a different training. It definitely is not something to jump into with both feet. Um, but perhaps more concerningly, in the uncertain section of McGain's paper, they talk about Tiva's other environmental impacts. So when we take drugs into our body, um, with the exception of the volatiles that aren't really metabolised, most of the injectables that we um, take in uh, are metabolised and then excreted either usually through, through the urinary or the, or the fecal system. And most of our waterways are not designed to filter out these pharmaceuticals. So if those metabolites are active, uh, or indeed if some of the active drug is unmetabolised and excreted, then they do have environmental impacts. And we don't really understand what the um, quantifiable impact of those drugs is in our waterways and um, aquatic ecosystems at the moment. So that's just a caveat to bear in mind. Um, at the moment, the impact probably isn't huge because we don't use a lot of TIVA or injectables. Um, so th that's just something to, to bear in mind for the future. So really in this session, what we've covered is where the environmental impacts from anaesthetic practices are, um, how to reduce your carbon emissions when you're using a non-rebreathing system with a capnograph and when using a circle system. And thank you very much for listening. And we have now time for a Q&A session so that we can go through all of these um, questions and points and try and direct you towards uh, answers for your clinical practice. Thank you very much.